Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 84 of the Citrix Session. I'm your host, Andy Whiteside. It's, uh, it's been a few weeks for me. I think I had a, a fill-in guest a couple weeks ago, and uh, I think in between that, I've been traveling and doing conferences and vacations, so happy to be back. Uh, I've got uh, Ben Rogers on. Ben is the uh, local sales engineer, I guess local, uh, local in terms of commercial sales engineer, but doing a lot of healthcare stuff across uh, parts of the country, at least. Ben, how's it going? Good, Andy. I have been absent from the role as myself. I went on vacation and then uh, had something go down last week, so it's good for me to be back in the chair as well. Welcome back. So is the moral of the story, we just need to plan these at seven, six o'clock on Monday nights? Ooh, I don't know, man. My wife is, uh, she's wondering why I'm podcasting at 6 p.m. I've got a, uh, I've got a seven o'clock flight to Boston in the, in the morning. I don't think my wife realized that when I called her a while ago. Um, surprise. <laughs> uh, all right. We've got uh, John Splone with us. John has been on several uh, recent Zintegra podcasts on John is a, um, a new employee here at Zintegra sales engineer. John has a uh, extensive background with Citrix and other technologies related to EUC. John, um, I know we've joked about this on several podcasts already, but I believe this is your first full Citrix one. You uh, saw Citrix for the first time in what year? Oh, geez. Thanks, man. Uh, let's see, 97, 98? Yeah. Well, I'm going to do this. Uh, I do it to everybody. Do you remember the very first time you saw the technology and what you thought to yourself? I, I thought it was amazing. We were, uh, I was working for a mortgage company at the time. Mm -hmm. And we were using a database software that was burstable over the wire at that time, 350 megs, yeah. which would just choke the environment. So we came across this solution called Citrix, and the rest was history. The, uh, if, if, and I'm sure based on that comment, you were just like me, like so many applicable use cases just start coming together. Um, what's, yeah. the number one, what's the number one advancement that's made? the delivery of a desktop or app presentation layer where it is today. What's the number one thing that you think has made it more real than ever? Oh. I think it's an easy answer, by the way. So don't overthink okay. it. Then, then go ahead and answer. Um, <laughs> no, good. That, that I, was such a good pause. I want to hear your answer. Yeah. It, it, I mean, there's so much because I'll be honest with you. It's still the core ICA. Yeah. from back in the day. So I think it's more, from my standpoint, I think it's just more acceptance of remote usability and use cases from businesses and users. So you, you actually said, in what is my opinion, the answer a while ago, the, the reason why you used it the first time was for what purpose? Oh, to make life easier with the application that we were trying to, to get multiple offices to use. And so you had bandwidth scenarios where it just wasn't possible to do yeah. it another way, right? Oh, yeah. Now we've got, you know, 3G, LTE, 5G, whatever, right here in our hand. I, I work pretty efficiently on an airplane most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time using a Citrix session. That's like unfathomable back oh, then. Oh, yeah. Uh, agreed. It just, I, I couldn't even believe that that was on the horizon back then when we were first using this. Yeah. No, no way. Unless you watch those Nirvana phone videos and then you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Andy, you've you, you, you said something that has kind of sparked my interest when you said you, you think the the big thing is the protocol, basically the ICA. I, I see it a little bit differently now that I've come to Citrix as an employee. As a user of Citrix and manager of Citrix, for me, it was the convenience of being able to roll out single image hit 150 people, 200 people. But today, man, with Workspace app and how we are have the ability to go between any device and some of the tie-ins I'm starting to see with Rike and the reason we bought Rike, you know, like for 30 years, I think Citrix was, we'll get you to your work. I think where Citrix is going, I yeah. think, you know, is, is we're now getting into how do you do that work? Right. And that's what I'm getting excited about is I think the, the ICA protocol and our ability to do the presentation level, I think that, you know, that's a done deal for us as a company. We'll always do it and we'll do it well and we'll try to do it better than anybody else. But I really see the company starting to think about how do we bring people to work and how do we change the way they work 
with this lightweight protocol that we own and have, you know, our hands in. But uh, it's just interesting to see the transformation that Citrix is going through, particularly when you look at why they bought Reich and what we're going to start doing with it. Well, well, keep in mind, John talked about the amazing protocol, which has gotten better and better and better. My answer, though, was the amount of bandwidth, yes. which I think applies to everything you just said, as well as what John said. So, so we have uh, Andre, and Andre, it's been five minutes since you helped me practice your last name, and I'm gonna, I can't even do it now. So, uh, Andre Lavokivi, Lebovic, Lebovic, yeah, I wouldn't even close. Yeah. That was good, actually. That was really good. Uh, I don't know, man. So, Andre's with us. We're gonna cover a blog that one of Andre's peers wrote. Uh, Andre, um, a little bit of distortion just now. We practiced and practiced and practiced. You sound great a few minutes ago, Andre. Where are you calling? Uh, where are you calling in from? I'm calling from New Zealand. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you guys. Can you, is it distorted for you guys too? Yeah. Yeah, we, I swear oh, no. we bragged. Uh, we just bragged about bandwidth. We didn't talk about latency. Uh, and then all of a sudden we start talking. I think the uh, demo gods got us. So, Andre, um, what's how, your... Uh, how is it now? Oh, it's great. All of a sudden got better. Okay. I think it must have been Ben's video. I turned my video off there. <laughs> Crazy. Make fun of me. Yeah. So, so I'm Andre, going from New uh, Zealand. You're coming from New Zealand, but you're from Latin America? Well, I have actually a very convoluted story. I'm, I'm originally from Brazil. My family immigrated from Europe, uh, like during the war. Yep. I ended up in Australia, where I lived in Australia for over 10, 10 years. Um, I went to work for, uh, so I was doing VDI even before it was called VDI. Um, was one of the you know, very early, I think, um, you know, WinFrame and Metaframe were just getting started at that point in time. And I uh, ended up actually going to work for VMware for some time okay. and end up actually being part of their uh, core uh, software, you know, uh, engineering team for their, their competitive product. So for a while, I was actually a competitor of, of Citrix. And then I moved to the U.S. with, with VMware and uh, lived in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley for over 10 years. I left VMware, I went to do a small little startup called Nutanix. I joined Nutanix, we were, I know you, I know you guys, I was looking at your, your website. I know you work with Nutanix. I joined Nutanix, we were like uh, about 100 people. And I left uh, four, four, and a, four years later, we were like four and a half thousand people. Um, incredible ride. Uh, my wife is from New Zealand. She wants to get back to New Zealand, have our daughter to grow up here experience a little bit of the, the culture here. So we moved back. And um, of course, I knew a lot of people from Citrix and you know, Trinitanix and partnerships and so on. So I decided to join Citrix. And uh, I've been here for one year. Um, it's been a great experience. Focused, I'm mostly focused, not so much focused on VDI and, and, um, and the whole piece of uh, virtualization and infrastructure, but more on the security side, zero trust, SASE. Um, everything that we are doing around uh, making sure uh, this new world is safe for employers and employees and customers. Yeah, now, that's interesting because we we talked a lot about legacy and, and Ben brought up the, the future things that Citrix doing around uh, helping people get work done. And then you're talking about really protecting those users from things that are out there. I, I got to mention first that your story sounds like you must be like 150 years old. You look great, man, for somebody who's 100 years old. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't. I, it, okay, we'll move on. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so it must be the, uh, the 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 down under living, whether you're on which side of the down under, but uh, um, yeah, the the, co the code preserves you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so um, the blog that we're going to talk about today, let me pull it up so I can refresh myself on the title. Oh, I shut it. Great. Um, sorry. I'm not even sharing my screen yet, which is great because I don't want to be. Sorry, I usually have this totally prepared. I've totally screwed this up, but I will be able to have it up and running in just a second. And the blog we're talking about is around around the world of zero trust and in the new hybrid workspace that we're all living in. Uh, let me share my screen so we can walk through it together. That's what happens when you do a podcast at six o'clock at night and you're supposed to be at home. 
So the title of the blog written by Daniel Jim, which is one of your colleagues, is Hybrid Work and Hackers, the 2021 Zero Trust Approach to Security. I, I love what you're doing here, right? Daniel is going through this in the day of a life of a normal user and, and how that user probably just goes about their day with no idea that this new working world of work from home a little bit, go in the office a little bit, work from a coffee shop, go to the gym, get done, knock out a few more work items is really just a plethora of opportunity for people that are trying to get access to what you're doing. Um, you want to kind of talk through the idea of this blog? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this has a lot to do with you know, SASE uh, framework and, and zero trust. If you, if you think how organizations traditionally uh, protect themselves, we had uh, the servers in the data center, had our applications in the data center, uh, there's a you know, data center network and, and you have ports open with firewalls um, to allow you know, your customers, your employees to access your, all your data in your applications. And that's typically how we did IT for the past, um, I don't know, 25 years. We'd have a VPN there. So once you authenticate a user, you get access to, to the network and then you have access to the kingdom. And if you relate to how uh, traditionally, castles would have be, would be protected, right? So they would have a, a moat that would protect the castle. But once you over the moat and over the, the 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 bridge, then you are in the castle and you have access to everything. But things have really changed. If you think, think Andre, you know, I, I, in a in a broader, go ahead. I want to comment on something real quick. Based the way you're telling that story, that's the assumption that a lot of people work like you and John and Ben and I have for a bunch of years, where we've been remote. I mean, there's just a massive percentage of people that are no longer going into the castle to do work they're coming from outside the castle which is what what you're highlighting here right just a massive cultural shift in general first the absolute correct correct but as a, as as, a, as i'll tell you the story you also understand that some of the changes that are doing around security and they're not only apply to those remote workers but also to the workers that are inside um, the walls of your data center inside the office because you no know, even though we're going to a hybrid work model, you know, we, we, we know there will still be a lot of people, especially task workers, they will be working in offices. You know, eventually we'll get over the hump with, with all the, with COVID and, and the pandemic. Um, but you have like, you know, maybe call center agents, they have task workers that will have to be in the office. While uh, the way I see it, hybrid workers or knowledge workers will uh, probably have a more hybrid model. Right, where they work from home, they work from a cafe, they have meetings, they go into the office and then come back. And to some extent, this is already happening, have been, ha has been happening for many years now. But I think the, the whole thing is going to only get uh, increase in the way we do, we do that. Can we, and that's, um, can we stop real quick and just ask ahead. the panel, including yourself, let's say what, before the pandemic, what percentage of users do you think were hybrid users? What percentage of employees? Um, before the pandemic, but well, with the pandemic, I think every, most of us went went remote, right? But I think eventually uh, many of us will go back to the office. Um, even though you know you look at what Gardner is saying in, in IDC and others, I say that we will definitely increase the number of people that will still work from home because it has proven to be a uh, you know a good model for some organizations. You start to see this tech companies now saying, yeah, my developers can work from home anytime. They don't have to come to the office. We've been um, as productive or more productive than uh, with employees coming to the office. Um, what do you, so what before do you think the pandemic, what ahead. do you think the number was before the pandemic? Just a guess. I mean, 10. 10? What do you think, Andre? You think 10%? Um, I don't know, probably um, uh, 20%. Yeah. Something hey, John, like that. John, yeah, I, 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 think, I think around that 10, 15% pre pandemic. For remote workers, yeah. And Andre, obviously, you've been reading up a lot on this. What do you think the the post pandemic? Let's say two years from now, what does that look like? Mm. Uh, I think I think well, we can compare it to what it is right now because right now we are in the pandemic mode. But once we come out of the pandemic, um, I think the numbers will have increased for 40 percent probably. Yeah. Ben, Ben, John, do you guys agree with that number? Mm, I was thinking 50 50 Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think uh, I think we'll see more creative things happening from the employees being able to demand the remote work and that being incentives. So I think those percentages will be pretty high 
uh, above that 50% mark. So I, I think I, one I, of the- I think, I, I think you can break down into different types of workers so, though, right? Um, yeah, I, I know. Exactly. I think oh, the, yeah. the, the, task the task workers that were traditionally in the office, they can be full-time at home because we do have technology nowadays that um, can support them there. Um, uh, no, and even like we're monitoring if you need to you know, look what they're doing, that, that we can all do that remotely. So I can see even the, the type of work is changing, right? Why we can, we would ha you would have people that can go to the office and it would be there like from nine to five and so on. Now we can have like maybe, you know, uh, retired people working and moms that have different time shifts that can do, you know, the, the work with the children and then work for a company in the afternoon, something like that. that I see that changing as well. The, the reason why I did that to you guys, because, you know, the number we came up with 50 is a two digit number, not a big number. However, when you apply that to the overall workforce, that is a gigantic freaking number, right? Well, industries are going to be different, too, because I'm looking at like healthcare. And, and to Andre's point, you know, what healthcare is facing right now is there's some people that are going to have to remain on site, especially on the clinical side that are dealing with patient care. But when you look at the back office and like the insurance collectors, the appointment people, I mean, one of the things I know where I was at at CNSA that was a barrier for us to getting people home specifically on the appointments is it wasn't the lack of getting them to the applications. It was the voice. How do we deal with the voice? How do we give them a voice over IP environment that will allow them to interact with the call queuing and the phone logic that we've got going on? So right now for me within healthcare, I see that kind of being a limitation. Sure. I can send the employees home. I can give them Citrix sessions. I can bring them back in, but having them process those phone calls that for me at the time that I was employed there was one of the things that kind of kept me hard charged, but phone systems are getting better every day. Voice over IP is getting better every day. I could see where appointments, medical records, uh, you know, business office, people, insurance adjusters, all those individuals don't have to come back into an office anymore. Right. Yeah. Without a doubt, there's going to be industry and job specific but 50, I, I still think it's going to be 50. I think 50% of all employees are going to work some manner of the week from home or wherever. So that just the reason I bring that up is because that just ties exactly what Andre is bringing up here is that world where we've got to figure out ways to protect them inside the castle and outside of it, as well as protect the castle. Certainly part of SASE, which I think Andre mentioned a while ago. I wanted to stop and explain what that is uh, officially defined as. Andre, you want to hit it? Well, hold on. I want to I yeah. I ask Andre a question here real quick. Andre, you said something earlier that caught my attention. When you're developing these search security strategies, you don't care whether the employee's sitting inside the four walls of the office or whether they're setting your remote. You're looking at each one of those scenarios all the same. And is your layer of protection looking at across the board? It don't matter inside, outside in the United States, out to the United States. I want you to elaborate a little bit because I thought that was very intriguing when you said that. that that's correct, Ben. Um, it shouldn't matter, right? It shouldn't matter. Um, you should uh, be protecting your, your data. At the end of the day, you're trying to protect your data, right? So we talk about applications and data, um, your resources, uh, independent of where um, a user or a hacker or you know, a, a bad actor is, is trying to access from, a device that they are accessing from, uh, they could be accessing from within your network, they could be actually in your office. Um, and I think that's the whole, the overall idea of zero, you no know, zero trust, which is a subset of SASE, which means secure access service edge, which is just a third umbrella term that Gartner created for a number of different uh, security procedures or security frameworks that a companies can apply to, to the organization. But I think it, this is the point where you don't trust, um, you don't trust the, 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 you know, the user or the device, you always continuously verifying that that user is authorized to access the application, the data, the resource, um, and so on. Um, yeah, that's the, that's, that's the overall idea of what zero trust is. And within zero trust, we have also zero trust network access, which is how your users will access um, those resources. 
And to some extent, you're right as well. It doesn't matter where they are coming from. Um, you, know, like you could have a bad, bad actor inside your organization. And the model that we had until now um, doesn't allow for any protection if the user is already inside your network. Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah, I just want to highlight something. I, I love the concept of secure access edge with edge being a moving target, right? The edge went from a, your home office to the coffee shop to in the office to the, you know, after your workout at the gym, at the bar. I can't tell you how many nights I go to the bar and work from the bar like an idiot with my laptop out. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a moving target and these solutions have to cover all those examples. It's a paradigm shift, though, because historically, and there's still a lot of thought of this today, is this is the inside of my environment, and this is the outside environment. And you see IT organizations creating two sets of rules. So to, to you know, kind of present them with the paradigm shift of just create one set of rules that don't matter where the user is going to be coming from, I see some customers struggling with that. And so, you know, that's where... Again, when Andre made that that point, it kind of hit me hard where it's like, it doesn't matter where the user's coming from. The rules ought to apply regardless. But that being said is easier than the paradigm shift of putting that to practice. So guys, I've, I've kind of had us jump all over the place and I apologize about that. But Andre, just to kind of sum up the first uh, section here is, it seems like a daunting task, but there's software and solutions out there today from companies like Citrix that, that make it not, not impossible, right? Yeah, it is possible today. Um, the only problem with that is that there's so many players in the market, so many vendors, and uh, those, some players are trying to solve what different kinds, players are trying to solve different kinds of problems, right? And putting all that together in a, in a cohesive solution inside your organization that is not a burden for IT is also very complex and difficult to manage. So what we say at Citrix, and I personally say the same, like as much you could consolidate all that in a single solution that can actually talk to each other and have an analytics cohesive um, that it looks through all the, you know, all the all solutions together or the, all the data together to come up with some um, interest insights um, that probably should the way organizations should try to strive for. Um, so uh, otherwise you end up with you know, 15, 20, 50 different solutions inside organizations and, and 50 is not an uncommon number of security products inside organizations to manage. So is it possible to attain that to deliver zero trust with multiple products? Yes, but it becomes very complex as well. Yeah, let me, let me run something by well, John first, and then you're welcome to jump in. What if I just told everybody that the only way you got work done at our company was to access the Citrix environment internally, externally, and that's the only place your device was allowed to go to, period. Would that be a security play? Uh, can you clarify that a little bit more? Sorry. Andy. What, what if I said the only way you can do work at our company is through Citrix, hosted apps, hosted desktops in our secure data center on our secure monitored VLAN, no matter where you're sitting in the world, you had to remote into Citrix or you had to use Citrix internally. Would that be a pretty good security stance? Right. I believe so. Yeah. Would that I, be something that then why don't we do that everywhere? I, I think some organizations have done that. I know from with my consultant hat, again, dating myself years ago a lot of organizations would do that they, where it was, you know, the Zen app environment was all they had for application access and the endpoints were either zero client endpoints or, or else a, a, a knockoff lower edge uh, windows machine that's sitting out there. I, I just don't think that everybody understands that. But, but John, would they do that for the remote users too? Yeah. And that's the only thing that remote machine could do. Yeah. So uh, there, there was an organization where we built a, the single environment where the remote users would come in and then that would be like their perimeter yep. and then they would access stuff from there. And, and that, that's the only way they could operate in the organization. Yeah. So, so the technical... Let, let, me, let, me, let me challenge you on that. Let me challenge you on that if you, if sure. you don't mind. Um, and I've been doing VDI and before that stopped and Zen app and now Zen for, for a very long time. 
that's all good. And that's how we, we used to do it and still do um, you know, provide access to users to their data and applications. But assume a user uh, authenticates through uh, Citrus Gateway or any other product, gets to their virtual desktop, they open the browser, they download the malware from inside the network, and now the malware is in that virtual desktop and suddenly, suddenly is across your network. Um, so while you protected the, 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 the gate, you allow the user to go in and inside the virtual desktop, they can do most anything. Unless now you start to lock down um, the environment, right. but then it doesn't, yeah. it's not productive, right? Because they still need access to a number of different things. Uh, look, there's different solutions for different problems. And, and, and so it's just kind of, you can see that where zero trust can really uh, change the game or the paradigm in the way you think about security. Well, so to be clear, I kind of set John up with that, right? If, if Andre or Ben, Maybe not Ben, because I've worked with Ben when he's a customer, but Andre or John or Andy had our choice. We would just lock everybody down and we wouldn't yeah. have these issues, right? But how real <laughs> is that reality? It's, it's not really 100% real, but yeah, I mean, and I agree with what you were saying, Andre, is that, that if you are checking them at the gate, but not checking them in the back end, then you run into problems. But then you also look at that, that standpoint, if I'm deploying this environment, I have to weigh those options. How am I going to check them on the back end? If I could, yeah, I would send every user to my Citrix environment for absolutely everything. And that, that's what they would get, no matter where they were. And yeah, things would be locked down. But that's ivory tower. Except for the CEO <laughs> that would fire John for making him do that. We'll see. We'll take that to the board. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Um, and I think that goes back to the sassy at the edge thing, but the edge could be inside the virtual desktop at that moment. It could be my phone at that moment. It could be whatever my device is at the moment. That, that damn edge is everywhere. That's what's changing. <laughs> That's the big difference now. The edge is, is where the request is coming from, where it could be from inside your network. Hey, Andre, I've got a question for you. We've talked a lot about apps and desktops and, and uh, you know, what Citrix has been doing for years. What are your thoughts around when we start getting into these micro apps and we're actually using, you know, workspace with Rike and triggering things and we're no longer, you know, we're taking pieces of the application. How does that change the security parameters on some of this stuff? Because, I understand where you're publishing a desktop person gets into the desktop. Now they have access to the inside network. They're in the four walls. Now they're using the internet or, or in all those things. But I'm thinking beyond where we start talking about now we're running micro apps on a, on a, you know, workspace app that could be running on a Linux, whatever, you know, going to John's point, we're giving the user a very, very, uh, you know, black box box that we wanted to run very specific things but the functionality is we're using micro apps. So that now means more of the security is coming down and talk to me a little bit about, talk to us a little bit about that, those types of scenarios and where we see that going. Yeah, no, that, that's an interesting point, Ben. Uh, of course, uh, micro apps for those, those who don't know, it's, uh, it's, it's part of a Citrix workspace app and it's kind of like an automation tool where you can extrapolate uh, certain uh, screens and fields from traditional SaaS applications and web applications and sort of make create like a workflow. As an example, we have many workflows inside Citrix. So if you want to request a, uh, you know, IT a, you know, a, to fix something, we just go into this micro app. And so instead of going to this uh, very complex website, I need to log in and I need to enter a number of different things. Everything uh, happens through the Workspace app in a very automated and workflow way. So it's really good from my productivity standpoint, but um, that's a good point. I actually never thought about the security angle where you actually, um, as you extrapolate or you create a layer between um, your user and the application itself, because now you are accessing the micro app, you actually removing the access from the application and potentially could completely remove the access to the application. Um, I never thought about uh, from this perspective, but there's certainly a security play there where um, you could eliminate direct access to the application, um, potentially removing those sort of like API 
level um, you know, failures or gaps in terms of security where, where you know, bad actors could potentially exploit. Yeah, I, I, I never thought about it. Um, it's not specifically the area where I'm, I'm working on, but I can definitely see an angle there. So Andre, um, VPNs, are they the answer or are they the problem? <laughs> VPNs are a problem. Um, uh, no, they, they, that, they allow you to go into the, the castle, right? And then have access to, to everything inside the walls, the walls of your data center. But Andre, I had to give it my username and password. Is that not enough? That's not a number. We've been evolving. Look, security is evolving all the time, right? So we went from username and passwords to uh, multi-factor authentication. Now we're talking about adaptive authentication, where um, we decide how you should authenticate based on a number of different factors. Right? It could be your device, it could be your location, it could be your role in the company, it could be where you access. You are in the office, outside the office. And based on that, we decide how you should authenticate. If you are a contractor who is accessing um, from within the United States, you get prompted in one way. If you leave the United States, you prompted in another way. So uh, this is all evolving. But even after you authenticate, um, you should still be uh, authenticated to access different types of applications. And then we start to talk about single sign-on. And uh, even further, we can take them to the next level, which Citrix does provide solutions for that. Now, are you able to copy, paste, print? Do you need a, you know, a watermark in your screen? Things like that, um, that organizations have been adopting. You know, we see, we see um, over and over again, organizations buying these products and, and trying to implement to, to restrict or allow users to do what they can do. Um, but the answer is uh, using the main password is definitely not enough. And even after the login, you still need to keep checking, constantly checking. So let's say as an example, or this is a good example, actually, a user logs into the, with a laptop, um, you know, to their organization through Zero Trust, not to VPN. By the way, you can get more technical here and explain what Zero Trust Network access is if you want, because um, it's very different, very different from VPNs. Uh, but they get in there and then they leave the laptop um, you know, open, they go get a copy and then let's say they are Starbucks as an example, and then someone goes into their laptop and the laptop is open. That's, look, that's not uncommon, right? Let's, let's be honest here. Um, so there are solutions that are even looking at how you type, like right? you type, typing at the same pace. So encryption, uh, sorry, encryption. Uh, uh, security is always is evolving, and, and nowadays username and password definitely not enough. Yeah, it's in fact it's the opposite. It's a false sense of security, which is you're probably just letting the you know letting the, the wolf into the the fox into the hen house um, because he said he was you know Mr. Fox, vice friendly Mr. Fox. Sorry, right. that might be a bad one. Um, all right, well, so oh, so I'm gonna ask you. The ballpark, the number of, uh, do you have any numbers around people that, you know, companies that are still using VPN as that remote access secure solution? It's, it's an astronomically high number, isn't it? It is a high number. Look, we've been doing that for the past 25, 30 years, right? SSL and, and then TLS, this is all old technology. Um, and while uh, they have been effective in the past, I think they haven't been effective for, for the past five years. And, more and more, you're also starting to see sort of zero day attacks to, to VPNs that had the pulse um, zero day, I don't know, um, threat that recently occurred where had like thousands and thousands of, you know, VPNs, VPNs compromised. I don't know how many organizations, you know, have been um, attacked and their data stolen. So, and that, that brings me to actually to the zero trust network access angle. Because we talk about you no know, VPN being bad, but what is the solution? What what how how do we do? How do we change that? And a zero trust network access is really the opposite. Is you make a request for an application, but you don't access the application. It's an outbound uh, connection from within the data center to to the user, um, bringing the application back to you instead of the other way around. So even if that application is compromised in some way, 
you, users still don't have access to the to the internal applications, to the private application or the private network or all the resources that are inside the data center. So it's a paradigm shift in the way we do, uh, we allow access um, to, to the applications directly from the device. You can still do that from a you know, visual apps and desktop perspective. And a Citrix gateway will do exactly that, but then it's not a native experience on your laptop, on your device. And that's what Zero Trust uh, brings to, to the table. I think I'm kind of struggling with that one. Um, let me ask John to explain his interpretation of how that looks, if he has one. Um, so I, I, I mean, I'm I'm having a hard time wrapping around the definition of the use cases and yeah. and defining that based upon your users. I mean, before when you would talk VDI, you could come up with hundreds, and now it seems like that we can come up with thousands of use cases and, and how we, we break it down. I know there's a white paper, um, you know, helping to prioritize those use cases and good starting points with it, but it's just kind of, it, it is difficult to wrap your head around because then, you know, how does that affect that, that user productivity? You know, if I'm delivering back to them for that interaction, am I affecting natively how they're working if something comes up and they're locked down. I, I mean, Andre, that's it might, some of my questions to you, I guess. So the use case is, is, is look, uh, virtual desktops and applications is great and there is a certain use cases for that. But in many cases, you know, applications have, um, uh, no, organizations have applications that can be accessed directly from, from the laptops and or from you know, their tablets, mm -hmm. and that's the way they want to access. So how do you provide uh, that secure access to all those applications without having to put in place a you know, somewhat expensive infrastructure for visual uh, applications and desktops? And that's where Zero Trust comes in uh, handy, right? Let's give access to all the applications inside our organization, but in a secure way, in a way that it's an outbound connection instead of the user having to go inside your data center. So that would be um, you know, access to all, let's say IT sanctioned applications inside the data center. Um, another great use case that we see more and more is merging acquisitions, organizations acquiring um, new you know, companies and they don't wanna have all the users coming into the, their data centers to access their new applications. So they provide zero trust network access to the new company employees. Uh, in a way that they can access the applications that they are required to access in the resources, but without having to go through a VPN. Not to say that VPN is like, no, they are appliance based, they're hard to scale, they're hard to manage. We saw, you know, we so often see organizations struggling, especially with the pandemic. It's getting now more stable, but it's a, it's, it's a complex infrastructure. Um, so hey, those Andre. are sort of like, the, go ahead, sorry. Do, do applications have to be rewritten for zero trust network access or does the network know how to work through that for them? No, the, the, the solution will, will, will deal with uh, everything. You don't have to rewrite or do any kind of uh, anything different with your application. So with the way the Citrix, I can talk to the Citrix solution, right? I don't know others. The way it works is we have a cloud, it's a cloud service. Um, there's a cloud gateway kind of authentication where you do the multi the authentication, multi-factor authentication. You do the what we call the, the device posture assessment. Um, and we can check the device. We can check if antivirus virus is installed and all that. Um, and then uh, once authorized, there is a you deploy in your organization in your data center a, a kind of a gateway that will uh, communicate with the Citrus cloud service. Um, once that is done. Once the user authenticates, um, that gateway is responsible to get access to the application and send that back to the user in an outbound fashion um, instead of being an inbound set fashion. So literally we're changing uh, network access to application access, but without relying on like VDI and, and application virtualization infrastructure. Yeah. So no, they are, they are to answer your question, no, applications don't have to be rewritten, don't have to be changed. 
Um, and as part of that, because it goes through the Citrix cloud, you, we can still apply a number of different security controls and security policies on top of that. Yeah. Hey, I know Ben has uh, been very security conscious through the years and with solutions. Ben, are you are you following this? Have you seen people looking for this? Have you have you talked to customers about this type of solution yet? Well, one of the things that that you know I'm quite interested in with this is you know looking at anomalies. So I'm thinking about our analytics product and how we kind of put that in and we let that bake for a little bit and it kind of comes up with these are the norms for employees user activity, you know, those sorts of things. And then with machine learning and artificial intelligence, we can, we can pinpoint some of these anomalies. So like one of the things that I could see being an example of this is like ransomware. John Doe comes in every day, John Doe, you know, uses X megabytes worth of storage. And then all of a sudden John Doe's exploded and exploded in a very rapid uh, amount of time. Uh, with our analytics product, we can actually see that as anomalous activity and then start to shut that down. You know, we can actually, you know, say once it reaches this level, we're, we're terminating those sessions. And that's kind of how I think of the zero trust model is, yes, you're going to let them in the door. They're going to authenticate very similar what they're doing, but there's going to be something in the background that's listening to what's going on. And if something goes outside the bound, it's going to start paying attention to it. And then there's going to be a set of rules that if it starts to continue to see activity, it starts to remediate that activity. So those are a little bit of my thoughts of zero trust, but there's a lot to learn here on my part. Getting into the zero trust network access as well, um, you know, I, I think I'm at the tip of the iceberg as far as my knowledge on all of this from a Citrix perspective. Yeah, Ben, uh, but, you, but you were right. Um, so if you think of all the data that's being collected, uh, systems should be able, the analytics piece should be able to assign a, you know, a risk score for a given user. And this risk score really defines um, how the security should behave around that user. They might know, and the risk score should come from different factors, right? So like the, I, I think I mentioned, like the location, the device, the, the user role, and so on. Um, and, and this is, I think this is the holy grail for, for SASE and for zero trust. Now let's assign a score to the user based on a number of different, um, you know, uh, of different um, items that or different factors, and and we move we we'll go from there. Yeah. Um, sounds sounds like the only way forward is to do something like that. Um, sounds like there'll be a lot of a lot of definitions and things that'll have to be made along the way. But as, you know, as data shows up, there'll be more and more easier ways to classify and, and start to look for that. That's, that's where the, um, uh, I guess, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Uh, machine learning. That's, you know, that's where things like that are going to become more and more valuable, right? Uh, artificial intelligence. I think so. Analytics. Look, this is to some extent analytics. To some extent, you know, this is, all new, right, for most organizations. Uh, of course, there are organizations that are deploying, they're ahead of the curve, but uh, the large majority of uh, organizations are looking at it now and trying to decide how they're going to go about the SASE model and zero trust, zero trust network access. So I think the whole messaging and the way the industry talk about it is going to evolve for sure. Yeah. You know, I'm seeing a hidden gem in all of this. You know, we don't we don't talk a lot about our endpoint management product, but I can see where we start to, and, and you know, this this will not be today. I'm thinking 12, 24, 36 months down the road, but as we start to uncouple these applications from the data center and we're starting to look at more endpoint security, I can see endpoint management being, being pivotal to this, not only from a protection standpoint of give me a layer of protection on the endpoint, but also from an analytics standpoint of tell me what that endpoint's doing. Let me factor that into the analytics of what the user's doing with the applications or the desktop or the micro apps. And so I'm really beginning to see that product being an essential piece to this even though it might not be part of the SASE stack. Yeah, when, 
one additional thing, Ben, that I love is the fact that if I'm a Citrix shop, I've already got the Citrix workspace app on my machine and, and that agent based solution can just be baked right into that thing, managed right into that thing through the endpoint manager solution potentially. And all of a sudden I didn't have to add any additional software and I'm securing across the stack, whether it's a virtual app, desktop, app protection turned on off, as well as, you know, where's my endpoint trying to go to and, and what's, where's it allowed to go to. Well, guys, I, I think we're about to run out of time. Andre, thank you very much for joining us. I, I do want to ask you how, how Tuesday is because it's only Monday here and you've already experienced Tuesday and to make sure the world didn't fall apart while the rest of us are going to be asleep here in a little bit. Uh, but I did want to give uh, John a chance just to kind of chime in. John, anything else that you feel like is relevant here that we didn't cover? Uh, <clears throat> no, I, I do think this is, is a world continually evolving. And I do, do think this is very interesting. So there's more I would definitely like to have, especially with you, Andre, further discussions on these, these background checks and balances that are happening on these sessions in these users' interactions with the environment once they get through. But definitely, it's, it's going in the right place for where the environments are today for pandemics. You know, I just had a flashback to getting into a nightclub in my college years and then going back outside and taking the, the, the bracelet or whatever I got to my other friends and they all went in. And then once we got inside, nobody ever checked us again. Uh, I think that's kind of what we're talking about here, right? We got to be, we got to be, we got to be verifying at the front door, the back door, and then we've got to keep looking around for anomalies while whatever's happening is happening. I, sorry if that was a, an, an Andyism. that's what we call these around here, but that's, that's when things all of a sudden start coming to reality for me as to what what the applicableness of some solutions well i'll tell you man that watermark uh we had a win with that with a healthcare company and it was purely just a legal play the cio was like if i could just present that and show that in a court of law whatever happens the fact we got that on the screen does a lot for me legally so sometimes little technology things can make a big difference in a compliance legal world yeah yeah for sure hey ben why hey, you have the mic you can also Go ahead. So, sorry, just, just not to mention that you no, know, um, the whole BYO industry, where you no know, organizations are not actually giving devices to contractors and users and employees. Um, how do you protect your? How do you give access to, you know, to the applications to the users without opening firewalls and and VPNs um, to an unmanaged device? Unmanaged devices are somewhat easier, right? But what if the device is not managed? Yeah. That's that's another angle as well. Well, um, Ben, anything else before we let uh, before we let Andre start to take off on us? Nah, Andy, I always appreciate you having me part of this. John's good to meet you, and Andrew, Drew, good to meet you. Very informative uh, talk here, and and you know, Citrix is developing the story every day. It's just exciting to see where we're going with it. So, appreciate everybody being on the call and having me on the call. So Andre, anything that we didn't cover here that uh, in your current role um, that you would want to make sure we we had the opportunity to tell end users while they were listening? Or no, I think we had a pretty extensive conversation here. More more than that, we'll get too technical. I think it's all good. Thanks, thanks for having me. Really appreciate. It. Yeah, and love love to have have you back on. I, I I do have that outstanding question. How is Tuesday? Is it everything going to be all right for us? It's nice and sunny. What what time is it there? <laughs> Uh, no, it's uh, 11 a.m. 11 a.m. Wow, 11 a.m. next. I'll be on an airplane tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Uh, my guess is your Tuesday morning's better than mine. Well, yeah, gentlemen, I'm planning I... to fly anytime soon here. <laughs> oh man, I want to plane every week right now. So, um, guys, I appreciate it. This is great. We got to talk more about the uh, the security thing Citrix is doing. I think that's that plus Reich plus the legacy. It, I mean, technology wise. Citrix is doing a lot of interesting things that are very applicable. Well, gentlemen, with that, I'll let you go. Have a good uh, Monday evening or a good uh, Tuesday. Thanks, Thanks Andy. Andy.